Hello, greetings, and welcome everyone to this news video. I am the Ninjaneer, and the topics we're covering today are as follows. I agree with the Electric Viking. BMW doing the thing. Aptera's third quarter numbers. I got the power. I apologize. No tax credit is good. Devin Thorpe with Steve Fambro. What can the U.S. learn from Africa? And things I liked. Let's get started. Okay, so this first video that we're talking about, uh, the Electric Viking kind of uses an article as a springboard to talk about the current state of the electric vehicle industry. I appreciated this video a lot because it did go into a couple of things that I hadn't necessarily thought about. Uh, generally speaking, the consensus in the populace has been that GMs and other legacies are catching up to Teslas and Rivian uh, type folks of the world. I disagree with that assessment, as do the Electric Viking. Uh, there were other topics covered in this video as well. I would suggest you check them out in order to see said topics. Uh, it was a very enlightening video, like I was saying. It was also one that I could see the keyboard warriors, uh, especially the gearheads, getting in on. So yeah, just check it out if you have the time. It's pretty good. All right, so BMW smashes EV range total with 626 plus mile run without stopping for recharging. This is another one of those things, uh, just like the F-150 Lightning video that we saw uh, some time ago this year. They did basically what's uh, considered hypermiling. They didn't turn on the AC or the heater. They didn't have the radio on. They didn't do all kinds of fun stuff. They didn't go faster than a certain speed. They had special tires on. All this kind of crazy stuff. Uh, to make this 626 plus mile range possible. Now, I'm going to say the same thing I said with the F-150 Lightning 1000 mile video. It is fantastic that they are trying to make efficiency something that people care about. What I think would be more beneficial to the car companies in question is if they would go ahead and do these tests with normal conditions, normal drivers, just, hey, take this car for a spin until it dies. Do your normal stuff with the car so we can get testing data for the vehicle, that kind of stuff. That I would respect a lot more than what this is, especially considering the fact that as the article is written, and probably as it was instructed to be written, they only put the stipulations that help them achieve this goal at the very bottom of the article. Uh, the website that talked about this as well, like the actual BMW website, also had that same stipulation that where they put everything down at the bottom. Like, yeah, we got this much range. Terms and conditions apply at the bottom is basically what happened there uh, in both cases, in this case and on the website. So I... Yeah, I want to see the these kinds of numbers. I want to see you smash 626 miles with a regular person, say, hey, go do your thing, uh, drive around and on public streets, up mountains, down hills, and all that kind of stuff, and see what you get, and then they publish that number. Because that number, to me, is a lot more relevant and a lot more interesting, and so you may be wondering why I'm talking about this. It is just to emphasize that this number, while impressive, would be much more impressive if they didn't have to literally rewrite the book on how people drive cars in order to get that range. All right, the next story, Aptera released their Q3 2025 numbers. They are actually fairly encouraging. When you guys take a look at them, you will see that their, their burn rate is lower than what, um, what it was the previous Q3 of 2024. Um, you will also notice that they are working with a fairly long runway with respect to how much funding they actually have left. They are, generally speaking, in a pretty okay place when it comes to a startup company that is this capital intensive and, you know, doing their thing. They're doing a pretty good job. 
Uh, Aptera Owners Club talks about this in their video as well. They give, uh, sorry, he gives his opinion and uh, it is similar to mine. So guys, check this video out if you kind of want to know the nitty gritty. Um, and yeah, this is what oh, I like boy. to see, man. This is what I like to see. Uh, right here, Aptera put out a picture of their battery modules and I tried my best to approximate how many there actually were. Um, my best guess uh, was counting from the back here, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, and then kind of moving up to here, 16, and then moving up to here, 18. So uh, nine uh, per row, three rows back. Um, so nine, 18, 27. Um, plus the ones on the bottom. So we got like, uh, 54 battery packs here, which is, uh, very encouraging. There should be, uh, even more than this coming up at some point because they're going to be putting these in the actual test vehicles and they like, and test vehicles and things like that. Um, yeah, it's really cool to see this. It's really encouraging to see the fact that they've got these battery modules set up. Mind you, I also would like to emphasize that these battery modules look pristine. They are beautiful and they are small, man. Like it feels like the edge of this case is hugging the battery so closely that there's like no space, you know, between there. I'm wondering how they do that. Like what is the cooling like in this battery? Like I'm sure there's a cooling loop somewhere. Um, I don't know what it looks like. Like you can see on the bottom here uh, that it's a very flat piece of um, maybe aluminum or something like that that is uh, covering the bottom and then plastic on the top. Um, yeah, I really want to see the ins and outs of how they set up the cooling on this and what level of cooling is necessary because it's going to be drawing so much less uh, power and working the battery so much less hard than what other vehicles do because of their weight. Um, yeah, just it's really cool to see this. Uh, CTNS is making battery modules um, and they are coming together quickly. So yeah, this is definitely quick. I don't know how long uh, this particular development was, you know, in the making, but it seems like they have quite a few packs enough to put them into working vehicles. They're, they're, uh, prototype assembly line and you know getting the practice in for putting them into vehicles in mass so yeah really cool to see all right so let's get into this thing uh rivian says that the ev tax credit going away is good Um, a net positive. Now, there are a lot of things that this article covered that kind of uh, make his case, like uh, explain his points. And what it kind of boils down to is because legacy auto manufacturers decided to scale back on their EV manufacturing, it is actually good for Rivian. Um, it is a net positive for Rivian, which I agree with. Um, it is also a net positive for Tesla and things like that because they have less competition in a space that is going to define the EV industry moving forward. Um, um, yeah, so basically it lessens competition for um, purely electric vehicle companies, which is true. Uh, it also makes the interaction with the customer less crazy because when you see like electric vehicles that get the tax credit like for GM or Honda or something like that they will give you some kind of crazy monthly payment for at least like $38 per month or something like that and it will be that until it is not and people are starting to expect that very low uh, monthly payment, not realizing that they're basically not paying off any of their vehicle at all. There's all sorts of little things that uh, RJ talks about that makes this particular move uh, advantageous that I hadn't thought about before. Now, 
The real advantageous aspect of this situation would have been a revamping of the EV tax credit to actually benefit those people uh, on the lower end of the income spectrum to make this more appealing to them. Because if they had done that, if they had set up the EV tax credits to be um, more tailored to lower to middle income families, then... EVs would already be ubiquitous here. I believe that wholeheartedly because look at Norway and look at other places in the world who have surpassed the 50% threshold for new vehicle sales. All of those places, generally speaking, had some kind of tax credit and a very friendly climate towards EVs in general that allowed people to absorb those uh, new technologies into their lives. Um, they had good charging infrastructure from the jump. Like They built it out as people needed it. They had tax credits. They made sure that taxes weren't as uh, heavy on those who decided to switch over. Uh, there were all kinds of crazy stuff that those countries did and that we could have done that we didn't. Uh, or did to a lesser degree that made the tax credit as it existed here much worse than it could have been. So I agree with him here in a lot of ways, but I do believe that the EV tax credit needs to come back in a form that is more beneficial to uh, the entire spectrum of buyers as opposed to uh, how it was set up where it was more tailored to upper middle class-ish uh, range because yeah it, it it was interesting it was helpful it got a lot of EV adoption going but a revamping would be nice because um, let's get real no technology really gets uh get gets going here in America without some kind of uh, incentive for the people to get onto it. Sometimes the technology itself is strong enough to be that incentive, but as we are currently sitting in the EV industry, um, I do not think that the technology by itself is that compelling uh, to be its own uh, stimulus. So we're getting there. We're getting closer by the day, by the month, by the year, but we are not there yet. And so I believe the EV tax credits would be something that need to come back. But as they existed before, yeah, I am actually kind of glad that they're gone. All right, so there was a podcast here by uh, Devin Thorpe. You can see right there we go. I had to make sure he was on screen there by Devin Thorpe. He did an interview with Steve Fambro and talked about some of the things that uh, that could be their future plans. And uh, Steve did a great job of elaborating on those things. There wasn't a lot of new information in this particular uh, interview, but it is fun to see how um, they interacted and what questions were asked and things like that. You can really see the evolution of how Steve Fambro interacts with questions asked about Aptera now. They sound a lot more polished than what they did before, which you know can be a hindrance or a um, or a boon depending on you know how people interpret that. But as far as what I interpreted, this was a pretty well done interview. Both the questions and the answers were really solid. Okay, so renewable energy for SMEs, uh, solar and wind as drivers of sustainable growth. So generally speaking in, um, in Africa as it stands, small and medium sized businesses more or less drive the economy. And what those small to medium sized businesses understand is that the best way to uh, be able to grow is to build your energy infrastructure along with your business. And so they are investing heavily, generally speaking, into solar and things like that in order to make their um, in order to make their businesses grow more succinctly because it is harder to build a new power plant than it is to put a bunch of solar out there. We already know that. Um, we've already seen the numbers that it's cheaper to build solar than it is to build a new coal plant or something like that. Uh, it did not used to be that way. And in, in fact, fairly recently uh, that changed, like the last couple of years or so that's changed. And so uh, it is interesting that Africa specifically is, uh, as a continent, is taking advantage of this stuff in ways that people uh, 
can do pretty much anywhere, but is more or less uh, concentrated. Like it's it's energized, it's supercharged. There we go in Africa specifically because of these uh, small and medium sized businesses investing in the tech. So yeah, I liked seeing where uh, seeing where different countries are. Um, all countries are with respect to uh, the growing energy revolution and uh yeah i just i thought this was an interesting article because overall it just kind of outlines how a transition of this type can even happen in uh countries where people did not think it was possible for some strange reason uh well continents where people thought it wasn't possible for some reason okay dokie um i have generally been a fan of Tello. You guys already know that. Um, just as much as I am a fan of Aptera, um, you guys already know my ideal driveway, but this video talks in very plain terms about how much of a factor the hood size is of a vehicle. I had the opportunity to um, help somebody move into their home and when I did so, the first thing we did, of course, was walk by the moving truck. The moving truck's hood was at my nose, and I said to myself, Self, how is anybody going to be able to drive this thing in any meaningful way that's not dangerous anywhere that's not a road? Uh, because you have so much space and so much blind zone directly in front of your vehicle that it, it was, yeah. Long story short, Tello addresses this in this video here, and they do a great job of making it plain and um, helping people understand that not only is it a matter of efficiency and a matter of um, uh, compactness and drivability and all that kind of stuff, it is also a matter of safety. So yeah, just really solid video overall. This was the thing that I liked this week. Alrighty, thank you guys for watching this wonderful uh, news update. I am the engineer. Thank you guys for watching. Um, I do actually have Patreon and Ko-Fi set up. So if you guys would like to donate to that kind of thing, please uh, do so with the links on my page. And I will also start putting them in the description of my videos. Now, just to let you guys know, the express purpose of the Patreon and the Ko-Fi are to allow me to take trips to Aptera or anywhere else that the community agrees that I need to be in order to uh, cover the green energy revolution. Um, I also am trying to become a, a completely independent uh YouTuber, aka one that is uh, self-funded or funded by the populace. So if you guys are interested in doing that and helping me out to become, uh, you know, basically a full-time YouTuber, uh, both of those goals are set up in Patreon and Ko-Fi. Um, the Ko-Fi, by the way, is the one that I use for my uh, gaming channel. So you will see uh, gaming stuff all over the place. I do have to eventually set up a dedicated engineer one, but basically, I'm letting you guys know that both of those places, uh, both of those things, my, my Ko-Fi and my Patreon, go to the same place, and uh, it will all be used for the purpose of getting to Aptera and becoming a fully independent journalist um, and learning. Uh, my craft much better. So thank you guys for watching. Um, I appreciate your patience for me getting those two sites up and uh, yeah, catch you next time. Has my head been this low the entire time? My goodness, I forgot to square that up. All right. And so, uh, <laughs>